Hi there, my name is Yulia, and you are watching the very first episode on my brand new channel, with a name I hope you'll remember and return to, Rebels and Revolutions, Wind of Change or the Ultimate Evil. I have always been fascinated with revolutions, fascinated and a bit scared of them. As I read more about different rebellions and uprisings throughout history, I realize that most of them are accompanied by bloodshed and social catastrophe. But here's the thing, some rebellions open the door to a much better future since they overthrew old and oppressive or outdated regimes. Think American Revolution or the Peaceful German Revolution of 1989, which brought down the Berlin Wall and allowed for the unification of Germany. Other revolutions, however, were the catalyst for a pure evil downward spiral, with thousands, hundreds of thousands, and sometimes millions of lives lost. While the very problem that ignited those revolutions remains unsolved, the revolution simply transferred power and control from one group to another. The Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 in Russia as well as the French Revolution, are examples of these nightmare scenarios. And despite the brutality of the French Revolution, the cuts to society that it had inflicted were less painful than those of the Russian Revolution. The French eventually healed their wounds, while Russia still suffers from its past revolutionary darkness. I also realized that most of these rebellions, whether good or evil, resulted from the extreme polarization of society with one group unjustly prospering at the expense of another. It is always about power and money. Of course, you might think that my simplification of good and evil is a bit naive. In 1917, many of the Bolsheviks truly believed that they were channeling the ultimate good. Just have to kill a few million class enemies and then paradise will be just around the corner. But not all of these class enemies appreciated their revolutionary vision, and considered these agents of a brighter future as rather evil. See, here's why I started this channel. I want to understand when I should jump on the barricades supporting whichever revolution comes next, and when I should storm these same barricades in opposition to the forces of chaos. On this channel, I will take one rebellion at a time and research it as deeply as I can and then I'll share my findings with you. To be clear, I am not trying to pretend that I can teach anybody. I'm 13, what do I know? But I am learning, and I hope that what I find would interest some of my viewers. I trust that you will join me on this journey and that you will comment and add your valuable insights in my exploration of this incredibly fascinating topic of rebels and revolutions. Let us begin. For our first episode, I chose one of my favorite topics, the Satsuma Rebellion, where a few thousand vastly outnumbered samurai, knowing perfectly well that they could never prevail, still took a suicidal stand against a much superior imperial army. Why would someone sign up for a mission that would lead to certain death? Stay with us to find out. First, let's start with when, where, who, and why. When. 1877. Where? Satsuma, Japan. Who? Samurai or Shizoku, the old warrior class led by Saigo Takamori against the government of Emperor Meiji. Why? Satsuma Rebellion was the uprising of the samurai class against the government, which made samurai obsolete by switching to a conscript army. The rebellion business is very dramatic and tends to be over-romanticized. The Satsuma Rebellion is no exception. It is known throughout the world as the last desperate battle of the honorable warriors, who looked with disdain on modern firearms, artillery, and other weapons of mass destruction, because they require minimal training for those who pull the trigger. Those brave boys honor the generation-long samurai tradition, or Bushidoko of honorable fighting, mastery of sword, and all sorts of martial arts. To me, it does not get any more romantic than that. A bunch of rebellious guys who sacrificed their lives for their Japanese motherland countless of times are no longer needed. They are simply discarded like an old flip phone, swapped for a shiny new iPhone, or in this case, shiny new howitzers machine guns. 
Predictably, they rebelled against this evil and heartless government that betrayed them. They engaged in a hopeless battle to seek an honorable death. Such a path is preferred by a true samurai, rather than settling for a boring and demeaning life as a commoner. That is how I understood this rebellion before I had the chance to investigate it. The more I dug, the less romantic it became. Though it was not a disappointment at all. In fact, I uncovered a possible answer to a question I often wondered about. How did Japan end up being so militaristic? Which ultimately led to their entrance into World War II, Pearl Harbor, and their ultimate defeat. But let's take it one step at a time. First of all, who were the samurai? Samurai were a member of the warrior class. They were career military aristocracy that effectively ruled Japan from the 12th century to the Meiji Restoration in 1868. They were great warriors, but aside from war, they really didn't have many practical skills. Once Japan embarked on a rapid course of westernization and industrialization, it was just a matter of time before the privileged social status of the samurai class was itself on the chopping block. Samurai were not exactly turn-the-other-cheek type of guys, so when the new Meiji government hit them hard, they hit back. The rebellion can be separated into three distinct periods. February through April 1877, the siege of Kumamoto Castle. April through September, the retreat from Kumamoto Castle. And September through November, the Kagoshima period and the Shiroyama battle. That, in a nutshell, is the story of the Satsuma Rebellion. This conflict is often seen as the struggle of progressive but heartless forces of change, represented by the new Meiji government versus the conservative force of the old, outdated, but honorable and even lovable class represented by the samurai, who fought the tide of history while attempting to cling to their old perks. While I do not claim to be a rebellion expert, actions against my parents notwithstanding, I did notice that neat narratives like this tend to hide a much greater complexity. The first and possibly most obvious thing that does not fit is the fact that the leader of the Satsuma Rebellion, Field Marshal Saigo Takamori, the samurai on steroids, was the greatest hero of the Meiji Restoration. The Restoration ended the feudalistic military dictatorship of the Tokugawa shoguns, which were the main benefactors of the samurai class. So why would the prominent samurai leader be fighting for the new imperial regime, which was sure to bring the very reforms that would spell the end of the samurai existence as a class? Truth be told, samurai were dying way before the restoration of Emperor Meiji. The worst thing for a warrior class is the absence of war. And during the last 200 years or so of the Tokugawa period, relative peace prevailed. Samurai became bureaucrats in local administration, teachers in military school, Zen followers, and origami instructors. Their value to society kept going lower and lower, and so did their stipend, the main source of their financial stability. Thus, samurai were eager to help overturn the old regime, with Saigo Takamori getting a key position in the Meiji government as a reward for his role in the restoration. So here's a cute situation. The very leader of the Satsuma Rebellion was one of the most important contributors in making the Meiji Restoration possible to begin with. Did he not know that he was signing a death sentence for his own class? I am sure he did. Then why did he simply pack up and leave the government to start acting like Neo in the Matrix? One thing that Saigo and his followers had in common with the new reformist Meiji government is a passionate belief that Japan needs to become a massive military power to ward off western ambitions in the region and to dominate their neighbors. Saigo was a Zen Buddhist during major holidays and on weekends only, and an ultra-aggressive militarist during business hours. He wanted to attack Korea. In fact, he thought that this would reunite the old samurai warriors and the new conscript army into the ultimate fighting machine. He was deathly afraid that the military class would split into the new and the old, which would then fight and undermine each other, thus weakening the country's military might. That the old samurai simply could not allow, 
and he personally did a lot to convert samurai warriors into the new modern army fighters. Saigo even offered to go to Korea as a government representative and insult Korean officials in such a nasty way that they will have to kill him just to save their honor, thus giving Japan a reason to go pound their Korean neighbors. And when the emperor told him, no thanks, Saigo went back to his hometown and started the rebellion. At least that is yet another commonly accepted notion about the Satsuma Rebellion. Just imagine, you have a leading position in the government. You are very high-minded and patriotic. In your current position, you can influence the course of the turbulent reforms. You may not like everything that your government is doing, but you are smart enough to understand that starting the rebellion is the last option. In fact, by starting a bit of a revolution, you are guaranteeing yourself and your supporters comfortable spots in the local Satsuma cemetery, without any chance of influencing the outcome of history. So why did Saigo Takamori resign, move to his hometown, and withdraw from his public life? And no, he did not start the rebellion in protest. But Saigo did encourage his supporters, mostly Semurai or Shizoku, to gather around him while posting inflammatory rhetoric all over Samurai Twitter and honing their martial arts skills. He must have known that this mini army of unhappy artists, formerly known as Samurai, would not remain passive for long. Saigo fans up to this day insist that he did not want to fight and that he did not begin the rebellion. As proof, they often repeat the story of Kumamoto Castle. According to the story, Saigo wished to travel to see the Emperor to outline his grievances. His entourage had to pass through the Kumamoto castle, which was guarded by the newly minted Imperial Army, commanded by an old samurai pal of Saigo's, General Yamagato Aritomo. Saigo sent a very nice letter asking for a free passage. Several young and partially educated hotheads in his inner circle created another letter, which they sent to the commander of the castle's defenders. Using insulting and borderline inappropriate language, they demanded an unconditional surrender of the castle, or else. The castle's defenders received the rude letter first, and thinking it came from Takamori, accepted the challenge. This started a confrontation between the Imperial Army and the rebels. At the onset of the conflict, Saigo had almost 15,000 soldiers at his disposal, a formidable force organized into seven regiments versus a 30,000 strong imperial army. Well, I have no reason to believe that this story is fake, I suspect that Saigo knew that sooner or later, the conflict would erupt. In fact, his men, though outnumbered two to one, were extremely well trained in tactical warfare, employing a very creative use of fire diversion tactics in lieu of artillery use. Which brings me to yet another inconsistency in a commonly accepted image of this rebellion. As the fight of the ultra-brave samurai who rejected the use of firearms as unworthy and dishonorable, since anyone can quickly learn how to pull a trigger. Samurai were simply better than that, dedicating their whole lives to perfecting their swordsmanship. In fact, several Japanese historians that I came across admitted that at the start of the rebellion, the Saigo boys were better equipped than the soldiers in the Imperial Army with a more widespread use of breech-loading Snyder rifles in addition to muzzle-loading ones. How did that happen? In fact, one of the first moves by the rebels was to attack the armory in Satsuma, Kagoshima Prefecture, as well as to confiscate an imperial ship transporting ammunition for the army. Thus, samurai were no strangers to pulling a trigger when it suited them. True, at the final battle of Shiroyama, the samurai army did not use any artillery or firearms. Why? After their unsuccessful attempt to take Kumamoto Castle by siege, the rebels were forced to retreat after the imperial army sent reinforcements to lift the blockade. In fact, Saigo and his men were in such a hurry that they lost their supply lines and soon ran out of ammunition completely. By the time the game of cat and mouse between rebels and imperial army was over, on the eve of the last battle, samurai simply had to revert to their ultimate weapon, the katana sword and the bone arrow. But they did not do that out of romantic notion of battlefield honor. The last battle was glorious indeed, and sad, and desperate, and a bit pointless. The samurai were outnumbered 60 to 1, 
Yet they fought and died or committed ritual suicide, seppuku, as a respected alternative to dishonor or defeat. And yet all my research did not answer one seemingly simple question. Why did the samurai have to die? What was Saigo trying to achieve since he most likely knew that the rebellion was doomed from the very start? Well, I still do not have a solid answer, I came across a remarkable series of articles published in Russia by a historian of Japanese descent, Takuan Soho. In these three separate works, Soho promotes the idea that even before the rebellion began, Saigo knew that it would not succeed, and that he and his followers would die. Yet, that is exactly what he wanted to happen. Saigo knew that his rebellion attracted an overwhelming majority of disaffected samurai warriors, who would not fit into the New Japan, and would cause trouble for years and decades to come. In truth, if samurai warriors were to win back some of their privileges, the Japanese military might have been split into two camps, the old and the new. According to Soho, Saigo realized that the best thing for Japan was to move forward with radical reforms, and that those reforms must be led by the military. And for that idea to succeed, samurai had to disappear. Well, I am not sure if this theory holds water, I found this twist to be an unusual conclusion to this amazing story of the last samurai. I thank you so much for watching Rebels and Revolutions. Please like us and subscribe to this channel. Until next time, so long.